Thank you for your bravery tonight. I love you. <laughs> Wait, what? There's some impressive variety in the world of Sony Pictures Animation movies, even compared to other big studios, and the exact same can be said of the parental bonds therein. Some of these parents are everyday heroes, some are magical beings, some are literal monsters, and some are metaphorical monsters. But whatever shape, size, and species they come in, I'm Kifinosi with Wicked Binge, and this is Sony Pictures Animation Parental Relationships Healthy to Toxic. Like always, we're gonna start with the most impressively healthy parent-child relationships in the Healthy Relationships category. Normally the top spot on lists like this require at least a little bit of critical thought, but there's no way the gold medal of health can go to anyone but Papa Smurf and the Smurfs. I dare anyone to try and deny my claim that Papa Smurf is one of the most wholesome cartoon characters ever created. Being a good dad to just one child is tough enough, but Papa Smurf thankfully succeeds in this regard for his children. All 100 of them, yes. Really. The Smurfs each have their own very different personalities, skill sets, strengths, weaknesses, so on and so forth. Papa is the glue that holds them all together, always providing wisdom, support, and guidance whenever his help is needed. Particularly heartwarming is his relationship with Smurfette, whom he took in and cared for as a real Smurf despite her being a spy created and sent by Gargamel. And I betray Gargamel and I don't even care! In all respects, Papa is pretty much the perfect dad. The worst you could really say about him is that he's overprotective, but considering the giant wizard trying to torture them for for their essence in order to increase his magical power and take over the world, I think we can give Papa a pass. What an absolute parenting god. These next two have a bond as sweet as an ice cream snowstorm, Earl and Calvin Devereaux, from Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs. Earl is a fairly intense cop for the relatively peaceful town of Swallow Falls, but when he's not protecting the citizens from Flint Lockwood's crazy inventions, he's being a doting father to his son Cal. Prideful though he may be, Earl's willing to put his ego aside to ask Flint to create an ice cream snow day for Calvin's birthday, with the full Cinderfur. This ice cream snow day was an event that not only made us all jealous as kids, but that showed just how much Earl loves his boy. It takes a lot to go to your arch rival for help, which demonstrates that making Cal happy is more important to Earl than anything else. There's also this exchange. I love you, son. I know, Dad. You tell me every day. Man, it really is enough to make a grown man cry, huh? <laughs> Taking the bronze medal of good is the adoptive park ranger slash bear bond between Beth and Boog. It's impressive enough to rescue a bear cub, but to proceed to raise it as a pet slash child all the way to adulthood is a whole nother level. Being a literal grizzly bear, Boog does cause Beth his fair share of trouble, but it's never intentional, and while Beth does tend to spoil Boog oftentimes, it's clear that he reciprocates her love. The two put on fun shows for the people of Timberline and are beloved throughout the town, showing that they do work well together. Even when Boog is released into the wild during the titular open season to roam free, Beth rushes in to help save him from resident poacher Shaw. And when it turns out that Boog has found his people and home in the wild, she bids him and Dinkleman a fond farewell. You are home. As they say, if you love something, be willing to let it go. Up next, we have the raising of yet another species of kid, Mavis, Johnny, and Dennis. With how sincere the love between Mavis, Dracula, and her human hubby is, it's no surprise that so much love rubbed off on their little vampire-human hybrid. Granted, neither parent is perfect, Mavis can be a bit overly protective, Give me my son. and Johnny is a kid at heart himself, which there's nothing necessarily wrong with, but it does sometimes lead to situations that make it seem like he's the one being babysat by Dennis. But neither of these flaws get into a downright egregious area, and they're more than overshadowed by the love they have for Dennis, from dropping everything to help comfort Dennis when Vlad terrorizes him at his birthday party, to going all out to throw said party. The parenting apple didn't fall too far from the tree either. The next healthy 118 year parental bond is Count Dracula and Mavis. Now on the surface, this is one of the most visibly flawed relationships on our list. Drac is more than willing to lie to or even manipulate Mavis to his own devices, perhaps most notably in the first Hotel Transylvania movie, in which she goes to the trouble to traumatize her with a whole village of hostile humans to try and destroy any desire she has to go out and see the world. Dad was right. Dad was right. This alone would usually be enough to drop him down to at least the gray area, but for Dracula, it all comes from a place of love. It's worth noting too that he has a fair bit of trauma given his first love was murdered by humans. Dracula only wants to protect Mavis, who's really his entire world, and by the end of the movie, he's growing a more positive point of view on humanity due to Johnny and Mavis's love, even venturing out into the human world himself to find Johnny and make sure Mavis can be with her zing. There's enough love between these two to outshine their issues, which keeps him squarely in our healthy area. 
At the cotton tail end of the fully healthy section, we have Bee and Peter Rabbit, as well as the other rabbits too. Who doesn't love cute, cuddly bunnies? Well, the McGregors, I guess. But their friendly neighborhood Bee is a reliable source of comfort and protection for those bunnies, especially after the evil Mr. McGregor made a violent example out of their parents. Their bond does lose a few points for the fact that Peter literally blew up Bee's house, but no, you know what? No, it doesn't. That was all on you, Thomas. But we aren't getting into the toxic relationships quite so quickly. These relationships are a little tumultuous, but ultimately still come out as a net positive. We'll call these the Rocky relationships. Kicking off this territory are two humans from just about the strangest family on this list, Katie and Rick Mitchell. The Mitchells put the fun in dysfunctional. The most notable relationship to showcase that is between Katie, who has a passion for filmmaking and tech in general, and her father, Rick, who's an outdoorsman and doesn't really understand nor share her interests. Oh, sorry, Katie, I'm a little occupado. He can often come off as unsupportive or even downright cold, and as for Katie, She's willing to manipulate him into thinking she needs his help, even though all she cares about is getting out of the house. That said, by the end of the movie, the two begin to understand each other more. Rick learns to appreciate Katie's passion for film and discovers how he's hurt her through her masterfully created Dog Cop series. And Katie accepts that for all his faults, her dad genuinely means well. If the ending of the film is any indication, there's no amount of disagreement that can tear these two apart, even if the road does get a little bumpy sometimes. So, Dog Cop spinoff, when? Now, let's use those aforementioned bumps to bounce to the beat of our own drum to the next entry, Gabi and Rosa Hernandez. I want to give both of these two some leeway right out of the gate and point out that they are dealing with the death of Carlos, Gabi's father, and Rosa's husband. They're both in the throes of grief, so that needs to be taken into account here. That said, they both have some flaws. Rosa is often overbearing, trying a bit too hard to bring Gabi out of her shell when she might not be ready, and of course, filling the role of both parents is not easy. Hurry up and change. Gabi is belligerent and rebellious, which isn't unusual on its own, but tack on the fact that she runs away with Vivo for freaking Miami with her mother none the wiser, and you've got a sure recipe for giving your mom a heart attack. Naturally, Rosa goes Godspeed to rescue her, not without plenty of admittedly reasonable anger, at the end of the day. They're there for each other, and it's very clear that there's genuine love between them. But circumstances aside, this is definitely a connection they're both struggling with. Here's hoping our main man Vivo can help him out. If you're hungry, you're in luck. Next stop is Swallow Falls, where we'll find Flint and Tim. Tim Lockwood. After the loss of his wife, Fran, Tim struggled greatly to connect with his up-and-coming inventor. For all his attempts to connect with him over fishing metaphors, his fishing shop, really just fishing stuff mostly, it doesn't often go through. He also doesn't support Flint's full the sum defer due to the danger it poses. And while he does ultimately end up being right, it still would have been nice to at least cheer the guy on. But there's definitely love between these two. The monkey thought translator helped Tim to finally communicate his love for his son, and Flint both admires and cares for his dad, even caring enough about his safety to tell him to stay in the fishing boat while the others look for Flint's machine in the sequel. Up next is probably the parent with the least screen time of all on our list, Cody Glenn and Edna Maverick. A mother to two children, Edna is an average penguin woman who works to care for them. She shows some slight favoritism towards Glenn due to his more traditionally hardworking nature and doesn't show much support for Cody's dreams of becoming a professional surfer. But that aside, she does care deeply for both of her children and does her best to be there for them through their struggle with grief. Now we move on to what might be the most currently intriguing family dynamic on the list, Jefferson Davis, Rio Morales, and Miles Morales. Even if we were to ignore the elephant in the room, being that Miles has to constantly lie to his parents about his side gig as Spider-Man, there are some pretty noticeable issues in this relationship. They all love each other, of course, but that doesn't mean that there aren't some serious struggles here. Like, say, Jeff's struggle to properly connect with his son, or Miles' tendency to flake on family events in favor of his hero work. This was most notable when he missed his father's promotion celebration party, despite his best efforts. Things can get pretty messy in this family. On the surface, there are honestly more problems than positives, but if nothing else, none of those problems on either end are malicious. Also, Rio gets some bonus points for letting Miles chase after Gwen to see her for a bit longer. Everybody needs a wingman, wing mom. And for all of Jefferson's flaws, he does genuinely love his son and only wants to push him to be successful. Unfortunate circumstances and barriers keep these three from having a healthier bond, but hopefully Beyond the Spider-Verse will give their relationship some much needed growth. Getting back to the trend of overbearing parents is a connection between Din and his mother from The Wish Dragon. One of Sony's newest animated movies revolves around a college student named Din, who's saving up to see his best friend for the first time in years. This results in him ditching classes to earn money, much to the disappointment and absolute wrath of his mother. I knew it! Giving up! Giving school! 
Mom. She scolds him frequently and even smacks him around with a spoon sometimes, which, hear me out, might be why Din didn't feel comfortable telling her about his plans to reunite with Lina. Despite this, the pressure she places on Din comes from a place of desire for him to flourish and have good opportunities. You and I are not finished. And she does actually show great compassion for him when his plans fall through, along with ultimately supporting him when he's finally able to see Lina again. Most of her flaws can probably be attributed to cultural differences in parenting, and while she's by no means perfect, she's doing her best the only way she knows how. Everyone say a hearty meh to our final Rocky relationship, Mel, Mary, and Jean meh. Sincerest apologies to anyone who was lucky enough to forget the Emoji Movie existed, but Textopolis is our next stop, where the parents are about as good as their expressions suggest. Meh. Seriously, they aren't really phenomenal, given Mel's reluctance to give Jean his blessing to go to a cube and start working. If you really think you're ready. Not to mention the fact that he never tells his family the truth about him being a defective emoji as well, which likely would have done wonders for his son's mental health too. But they also aren't outright terrible. Mary seems pretty much fine, and Mel does come around ultimately. They're just meh. That's not even for the bit. There's just nothing here. Kind of like there's nothing left in the Rocky Relationships category, because these are downright toxic. Now, this is a bit of a strange choice, but the first toxic parental bond is between Wayne, Wanda, and the werewolf children. Being a parent isn't necessarily for everyone. You really need to know what you're getting into, and boy, did Wayne and Wanda ever fail to do that. I'm not even sure how they managed to survive this long. These kids are as rambunctious as they come, constantly keeping their folks on their toes, and we see in the third movie that the notion of being set free from them brings the parents pure joy, with Wayne expressing disappointment upon finding out that the daycare they're left at isn't permanent. In Transformania, he even takes advantage of being transformed into a human to leave Wanda as the sole parent bearing the burden of their kids. This is not funny, Wayne! I'm not laughing! If nothing else, they care for their children on a base level, but they also seem to view them as burdens before anything else, which is far from a good mindset to have as parents. Just get off her already, Wayne! From one holiday theme to another, let's head over to the North Pole and take a look at Arthur, Steve, and Malcolm, aka Santa Claus. It's hard to imagine Santa, of all people, being a less than ideal father, but he has a very special present he bestows upon his kids. Blatant favoritism. Malcolm can't even be bothered to remember the department his clumsy son Arthur works in. I work in letters, Dad. Meanwhile, he puts Steve in charge of practically everything year after year. Oh, don't worry though, he still generally takes all the credit for himself while putting off Steve's well-deserved promotion to Santahood. He also has great pride, arguing with Steve towards the end of the movie about who should place Gwen's bike under the tree. Then there's Arthur. Poor, clumsy, relatable Arthur. While ultimately Santa does end up gaining respect for Arthur, it takes the poor guy going on an across-the-globe journey to deliver a single present to gain his dad's approval. Both ends of his favoritism got a pretty raw deal, from Arthur being neglected to Steve being overworked and underappreciated. There's at least nothing close to abuse nor endangerment going on here, which saves the Jolly Fat Man from an even lower spot. Okay, I'm willing to bet you didn't expect these next guys to be so low. Elliot and his kids. Elliot is placed just outside of our bottom three for worst parental bonds for one reason. He's stupid. He might not be abusive, malicious, nor neglectful, but he's incredibly stupid. And this makes him a genuine danger to his kids. It's clear as day that both Giselle and his daughters see him as mentally just another kid, arguably even less competent. Kids. Keep an eye on your dad. Mm -hmm. As for his son Elvis, the apple didn't fall far from the tree, so whether it's constant rabbit fights or jumping into a pile of poison ivy, he's always glad to follow his dad's chaotic whims. The only thing keeping Elliot from an even worse placement is that for all of his faults, none of them are being done maliciously. But the simple fact is that he just really shouldn't be apparent with how reckless and incompetent he is. Gods help him if Giselle ever leaves him. Taking the bronze medal of toxicity is the relationship between Mr. Wang and Lena from the Wish Dream. Dragon. The father of Din's best friend, Wang is a distant father in every sense of the term. He's way too busy to spend any time at all with his daughter and always puts his company first. My dad's always late. Later, this is revealed to be out of fear that his company will soon go bankrupt. While this company defense strategy is at least in part due to his need to provide for his daughter, it seems to mostly be done out of a desire to maintain honor, especially considering Lena had to confirm that she cared about him, not the company. The man can't even be bothered to show up to Lena's birthday and uses her fame to push his company forward. He does love his daughter, but he loves his company and its status more, so here's hoping that he doesn't blow the second chance Din gave him via his wish on Long. The silver 
medalist of evil will give you some serious goosebumps. It's the relationship between R.L. Stein and Hannah. On the surface, this seems like a ludicrous choice, right? Stein isn't exactly father of the year or anything. He shelters Hannah way too much, not even letting her go outside, nor even bothering to explain why. He has little faith in and respect for her. No, I'm, Observe. I'm homeschool. But hey, it's at least done to protect her, right? Well, in a pretty dark twist, it's revealed that just as Stein's curse caused his monster to come to life, it also brought Hannah to life. She was the last ditch effort for Stein to escape loneliness. Knowing this, he really could have written Hannah to be perfectly happy and content, which would still be weird as hell, but it'd at least be nice-ish. But the fact that he continually shelters her and refuses to let her have any life of her own is practically abuse. Why bring someone into existence only to make them suffer? We don't see the two bonding or anything, she just kind of hates her existence. Even Jack Black can have flaws, I guess. But when it comes to dirty, dastardly, despicable, and other assorted words to describe parental figures, no one here even comes close to Gargamel and the Noddies. Yeah, it turns out that Smurfette wasn't the only attempt by Gargamel to make a spy to infiltrate Smurf Village. No, no, he made Huckus and Vexy too. He has to be badgered to even feed them, and God forbid you ever expect any sort of affection from him. He verbally abuses them constantly, tying their worth directly to how well they've done their job. Then you're both just deeply disappointing experiments. His worst deed by far, in terms of at least parenting, is using their lives as a bargaining chip, threatening to starve them if Smurfette didn't reveal how Papa turned her into a true blue Smurf. You know how we know he's easily the worst parent in the studio's history? Because through all of this, we didn't even mention the fact that Gargamel plans to torture and slave and ultimately kill the Naughties for their essence after turning them into true blue Smurfs. Forgive me for my language here, but that is just smurfed up, man.